All right, so we're here at the Prusa Research booth, and we're talking with Voita, who's uh, kind of developed and designed this product, the HT90. We want to get some in-depth engineering details about it and just kind of learn more about this machine because it's, uh, it's a bit of a showstopper for people who want to print high temperature materials. This episode is brought to you by Squarespace. The main feature of this sets it apart from most other printers on the market is that 90 degree chamber temperature capability. So going yes. from 60C to 90C, what exactly does that do for your users? It enables you to process a, a lot more polymers. The ones that you could process at lower temperatures and you do it with, with higher chamber temperatures. Actually, you, the fact you bring in the heat means you get a lot more layer adhesion and so a lot more strength. It also means that you can effectively print bigger and more complex geometries with the higher chamber temperature. Obviously, the main goal of the HT90 here is to print more advanced materials. So whenever you have the need not to just quickly you know, whip up a design with PLA or PTG, but you also need to verify the properties of the model. So let's say it's a gliding application, so you need pure nylon to do that. If it's a high temperature application, you need ABS or maybe polycarbonates. If it's a UV resistant application, then an ASA model would be appropriate. And so with all these polymers, which are industry standard, you need a heated chamber. So that's why we focused on the HT90 and we come up with a printer that's not only easy to use, affordable, but also has a huge build chamber and it can print materials that require the heat within the build chamber. Let's talk about some surface level things that I like about this printer. I mean, the main one for me is every printer I get in for review, I do decibel testing to see how loud it is. Some of them are literally as loud as being on a jetliner. Like a vacuum cleaner? Yeah, 70 plus decibels. This one I can't hear it at all. You can get right up next to this thing and it's, it's barely making any, uh, any noise. I kind of want to understand how that's possible or like, was that a design requirement? The ultimate design goal of this printer is so that every engineer can have the printer on his desk. So whenever you're working next to a printer, you don't want to have, like you said, a jetliner next to you. So there, there are many details actually that we had to focus on. One of them is getting the drivers right so that we get as little motor noise as possible. The other one actually has to do a lot with cooling. So with the H90, we came up with a brand new system of cooling. So as you can see, there are no ah. fans on the printhead. It's something like a turbine, which is not within the chamber, it's outside of the chamber. It's in the upper compartment. What the turbine does, it sucks in the hot air through a HEPA filter. So this ensures user safety, even with the printer in a, in a office environment and forces the air back using the dedicated tube down to the printhead. Here the air actually serves two purposes. Air is cooling the printhead itself, like a heatsink of, of, of the hot end, but if we want to, we can use the air like a layer cooling fan so to cool ah. details like overhangs, like bridges and stuff like that. And we're not talking about room temperature air. We are talking about the air which is within the chamber, which is like ADC in this case. Whenever you need the cooling air to cool things like bridges and overhangs, you can do that. But all the other times, when you're printing like straight walls, infills, you don't want to blast the air onto the object at all so that you get maximum layer adhesion. It's not a good idea to blast the cooling air onto the object all the time. The thing with the printer is though, it moves so fast that if you had a fan that would have to spin up, it would take so long that by the time you get the air pressure, right. it will already, already be gone. So what we have designed here is basically a stepper controlled flap which can react in milliseconds. So we're always getting the stream of air, we just can decide if we want to stream it onto the object and use it for layer cooling or divert it away into the chamber and recirculate it yeah. uh, within the chamber. So like in, in the standard operating mode where you don't have any part cooling, it's going to just take air from the, the tube and just like shoot it upwards so it's not blowing just on the part. Just shoot it away from the model, exactly. And it also has to do a lot with the noise you mentioned. Yeah. So obviously the more high temperature material you print, the less cooling you need to, to cool down the features. Yeah. So it's kind of funny. So if you print a lot of PLA on this printer, which you can definitely do, the turbine has to work a lot harder okay. to keep the chamber cool. If you're printing PC, you will hardly hear the turbine ever you know, spinning. So for right now, we've been only talking about the high flow print head we have uh, installed on this printer, okay. which is currently printing uh, ASA. 
we didn't stop there. We actually took it a step further. You can equip or you can connect another print head to the H90, which is not uh, a high flow print head. It's a high temp print head. So with the high temperature print head, you can melt everything until 500 degrees. Okay. So that would be your print head for plastics like Ultem, plastics like Peck, Peak, or polysol phones. Okay. And with these polymers, you get the ultimate performance in pretty much every direction. So mechanics-wise, temperature-wise, chemically resistant polymers. Just to give you an idea, this would be pure PEI or Ultem. Yeah. This thing can go almost up to 200 uh, C in operating temperatures. Has an awesome mechanical resistance, and there are very little solvents that can actually dissolve this kind of plastic. Okay. So in general, we, we call these uh, high-performance polymers. And so this is something we are really curious where this will uh, expand the possibilities of the engineers. So while you can print full object or full chamber uh, with polymers like ABS, PC or ASA, it's mostly small to medium sized parts for these high performance polymers, yeah. just, just given the properties they have and also given the price of these polymers yeah. as well. You don't want to be printing a five kilogram peak part. You could, but yeah. You could, but yeah. Okay, um, so like really to, to summarize, going from 60 degrees, which is kind of like the standard actively heated enclosure, to 90 degrees, you can get more out of the, the traditional you get, plastics. You get more polymers, so a wider range of polymers. You get much better strength out of them, and you can print la larger and more complex geometries as a result of that. Whenever there's a user who's getting the HG90, it's not just because he wants the print to get out, he also needs some mechanical performance of the, of the output, right? That's the, what the 90 stands for, right? The yes. 90C. You go up to 90C. Yeah. yeah. There's actually a nice way how we deliver the heat into the chamber. So instead of using like a localized source of heat, like a fan and a heater, mm -hmm. we actually heat up the both side panels oh, of the really? HG90. And so these these uh, white panels exactly. on the side? It just looks like they're one panel. There is actually yeah. an internal one, an insulation and an external one. Interesting. And so they heat up over the entirety of the panel. Yeah. And they pump the air into the chamber. So this results in two things. It's very efficient to put the heat inside the chamber. Right. And it also results in a very narrow distribution of the heat, which is really critical for large parts so that they do experience low temperature at one end and high temperature at the other. Yeah, one thing that immediately comes to mind for me is uh, for heat transfer, you have conduction, convection, and radiation. So by having these radiative panels all around, that, that just helps prevent losing heat to yep. everywhere else. We all know that browsing YouTube at work can get you in trouble. For me, it usually starts out with something useful like a SOLIDWORKS tutorial, but then I get lured into an hours long detour of watching cat videos. That's why I'm using today's sponsor, Squarespace, to post articles that are more related to professional and engineering content on my blog. With Squarespace, you can present information in a more professional and less distracting way. It organizes your content and you can combine it with relevant links, graphs, and other information. If you want to start building your own professional blog on Squarespace, you can try it out for free. And when you're ready to launch your website, go to squarespace.com slash nathanbuildsrobots for a 10% off your first purchase of a website or domain. Big thanks to Squarespace for sponsoring this episode. Now, let's get back to our coverage of the HT90. The overall design, it's super minimalistic, and I feel like it's focused on the user experience. So, first of all, I mean, I, I watched the little video you had on it earlier, but you feed the filament in on the right side here so you don't have to reach around to the back or in the top. That's going to be a lot easier. Also. Uh, you know, this concept of having this on the desk of every engineer. Most engineers work in a cubicle, and I don't know about other engineers out there, but my desk is very messy. And one of the things that I like, can I open the door on this one? Uh, or if it's won't. quick enough, you could. On most yeah. printers, the doors open outwards, so if you have crap on your desk, it's gonna knock it all over. This one, you can just pick up the lid like this and uh, put it back down, so you don't have to worry about knocking your, uh, your stuff over. Exactly. And, and then uh, instead of having the handle on the very bottom, they have a little gap here so you can actually kind of look in and see how the first layer is going down. Although the printer employs a similar load cell design like other Prusa products like the Mark IV and the XL, in the case of the HD90, we actually didn't put any gauges or any load cells onto the print head. Yeah. Uh, again, to keep it very light so that we can move it around faster and print faster. Instead, we are using three load cells which are under the print pad. So the okay. print pad is actually carried by load cells. And so you get very nice precision when you tap the nozzle 
onto the bed when you calibrate the printer. And so, but yeah, you can still verify the first layer if you feel like you want to do it. Obviously, you've got great lighting with those white panels yep. reflecting it so you can see all around the part. Effectively becomes a white box. Yeah, you can do a professional photography inside of this thing too. Um, so about the uh, Delta design, yes. one of the advantages that a lot of people are telling me about is uh, it takes most of the electronics out of the print chamber. So like if you look up here, up at the top, the, the belts just go into this top portion so that can be kept at a separate temperature than the rest of the build platform. That's is actually a huge advantage of the Delta design is the fact that you can enclose it quite easily and you can take all the sensitive electronics, motors, power supply, control boards out of the heat. Mm -hmm. And so in terms of making the design enclosed and heated, a Delta concept or a Delta machine is very often a very nice way of doing it because again, the only thing that actually that's still in the chamber is the linear rails the carbon fiber rod arms, the print head, and that's pretty much, pretty much it. Okay. So everything else is out of the chamber, ventilated, kept cool, so that you get the maximum lifespan out. And I have a question about the uh, the ball bearings yep. that are used to... Uh, magnetic, yeah, the magnetic joints. Yeah, so, I mean, on a traditional design, you'll use, like, rod end bearings, and then they'll add a spring to ensure there's, like, it takes up the slop. That produces wear, and uh, I guess it's... Probably we just, not we just make sure, so these are actually made uh, in-house by us. We tick weld, the spheres are hardened, used, used normally in ball bearings, and we tick them to a thread, to a machine part, so that we can actually uh, mount them to the, to the print head. Okay. And we use like really, really strong magnets. Even at those temperatures, magnets, some lower grade magnets will lose their... Uh, That's why they're magnets. custom made and we're using like the highest grade magnets for this. Okay. And is there any lubrication used yes. inside of there? Okay, so it's like you grease it up and then just clip it on there. And it's not just any grease, it's a little secret sauce ah, okay. used with our design. The Delta design in industry to do in general, so since the Deltas don't have to move the bed around, the bed is completely static. Yeah. You can print in some, let's say, obscure orientations, which otherwise wouldn't be possible if you really have to be swinging the print bed back and forth. Yeah. And so you can get away with less support your quality goes up. If you have a look at some of the printed parts. Wow, I thought this was an SLA part when I was looking at these earlier. Actually, so I, this I saw is... the same before I saw it at my colleague's desk. So this is uh, the Prusamen PA11 with carbon fibers. Yeah, and that's incredible. It looks gorgeous. Wow. So um, you mentioned engineering materials and uh, like that's kind of one of the big advantages you'd get by having a printer like this. It's kind of hard for me to understand because I haven't worked in the industries that you, you might have customers in. But I saw in your video you did some work with Volkswagen. In automotive, they don't use PLA or PTG or ABS for much. Well, ABS is used somewhat. A lot of ABS, a lot of ABS, but uh, even these industries are getting used to that uh, you, there's actually nothing wrong with using a PLA. It's an affordable polymer. It's easy to, to work with. You can get your prototypes really easy. But again, it always depends on the project that you're working on. Yeah. So what is the requirement? Is it just for shape? Are there any temperature requirements? Are there any mechanical requirements? Etc. Etc. I guess like for part validation, you want to have the correct material. If I wanted to verify like an engine cover yep. that needs to go up to you know, whatever the engine temperature runs at, then that's gonna need to be made out of a special material. If I just did PLA or PTG, I could do fit testing, but I couldn't do exactly. like actual validation. Usually what you do, you don't do all of these things in a single step. So you do it like stepwise. So first you do your shape validation. And once you reach the point where you're confident with the design, you can print it out of a material that will handle the heat, the, the chemicals or the... Nice example for this is this one. Uh, this is pure nylon. So for any application that would uh, be for gliding applications or friction, this would be a really nice material to not only verify the shape of it, but also the, you know, the properties, the final components need to have. Yeah, so you, know, you get that lubricity of nylon yeah. and you could do some fit testing. Friction and some, resistance, exactly. The surface finish will be a little different, but uh, yep. 
because it's got a little bit of layer lines, but it's sure, sure, just FDM yeah. for you. Usually for, for flexible applications, users would use something like a TPU. Yeah. With this object, this is actually softened nylon. Oh, okay. And so it has an incredible uh, toughness. mechanical yeah. resistance in terms of uh, energy return. Yeah. It also, it being a nylon, the chemical resistance is awesome. And the nice thing I like about it is, uh, you actually can't print this without a closed and heated chamber. Okay. If you print it on an open frame, it will just work. And so it's a nice example of not just you know your usual polymers like polycarbonates, ABS. So there are also polymers with very dedicated uses that you actually need the heated chamber for, and uh, yeah, are very interesting for the industry. And when you mentioned Volkswagen, they actually printed a lot of flexibles for their jigs and fixtures. Okay. And that's something that the HD90 is really good at, so printing flexibles in general. Yeah, fixturing is a big application for 3D printing because it's usually low volume and requires a lot of iterations to get right. So the printer obviously being a new printer within the Prusa Pro line integrates fully into the Prusa ecosystem. So we use Prusa Slicer to process the prints, uh, so the models for printing. It fully integrates into Prusa Connect. And uh, while we pay close attention for the printer having all the connectivity options a user might need, so Ethernet, Wi-Fi, Prusa Connect integration, we also kept in mind that there will be a lot of industries where connectivity is uh, strictly regulated or even forbidden. And so we made sure that the printer remains fully functional even in an offline environment. Okay, yeah. With all the functionality, including software updates and stuff like that. So because where's the uh, USB port? They're on the sides. Uh, oh, yeah, yeah, They're right on there. The, sides. the Ethernet port is integrated, and we actually used a Wi Fi dongle for connections so that whenever there's a connectivity ban or restriction, the user can simply take out the Wi Fi dongle. Yeah. And, you know, then the problem is solved. It just disables the wireless for, for exactly. when you need that. There is even a QC camera up here that is oh, okay. used for monitors the, the internal space of the printer for QC purposes. Uh, again, whenever there is a need, the user can disconnect the camera fully because you have certain areas of industries where there is a strict ban on connectivity, on cameras, and so we wanted to make sure we don't uh, limit the use of these printers so that this is also taken care of. Yeah, I've worked in a couple industries where you, know, you can't be sharing anything that you're printing whether it's due to like legal restrictions or legal, IP safety, IP, yeah. you know, all of my workflow that I do is off the off the internet. I just am used to doing it that way, and I appreciate when you know companies support that workflow because that's what I'm more comfortable with. I'm really happy that this is the base of the Prusa Pro line because we've seen a lot of use cases where there are a lot of industries where they use the Prusa, the original Prusa machines. Yeah, and you know. And some of them, they are perfectly fine with that. But with a lot of them, as you mentioned, they just need the more advanced materials to, to work with. And so this is the first, one of the first steps along with the AFS that forms the basis of the, uh, of the Prusa Pro line. Hmm. I don't know what else there is to, to say about this machine. I think it's just really awesome. I didn't show you this, but uh, this is something I've been working on. Eh? Yeah, yeah. So guess how long that took to print? <laughs> Since you're asking, yeah. Uh, it's like what, a millimeter and a half high? A uh, two millimeter Is layer high. Uh, <laughs> so four kilograms. Hours? It's uh, five hours. Oh man. Yeah. Here, uh, this is the this is the printer that I've been developing. Whoa. So, Whoa. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, uh, Wojtek, yep. uh, nice meeting you. Uh, it was a pleasure. Yeah. yeah. Cool. I'm really excited to see you know what ends up happening with these products and, and who ends up adopting them because yeah. I think a lot of uh, companies want something like this. Okay. All right. Thanks. Thank you. Good luck. Enjoy yeah. the rest of the show. Yeah. Bye. Okay.